most uh, at this school said it has to do with they have questions. And they were very successful at that lecture. Does anybody have any suggestions about what kinds of lectures they would like to see? If they would be willing to come to if we schedule them so that they would be available. Are there any things you'd be interested in? When the lecture series was started, Michael supported it, Michael Tundi, and I was given this little slot Friday at noon. <coughs> was the program against me. And that slowly eroded from now, I think it's about three or four classes, the constant meetings and stuff like that. And I also did it too, just every other week so that I didn't tie up every Friday so that I didn't know it. So, but there again, you, you're going to have to express yourself about that. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I can sort of plead until I'm willing to think, just making difference if there's not students. Voice and interest in the suggestions and things like that. So, thank you. Uh, I agree with you. It's going to be a fantastic edition. Let's close with that. Any other suggestions? I mean, would you be offended if I like, invite people who are like a little bit on the edge of technology, like film directors and people like that, who create a space, a kind of architectural space in films? Yeah. Is that the same problem? Hydrogen energy for fuel cells, and, you know, 
about it. It was going to be like an incredibly advanced uh, studio in order to maintain the, the cultural ecology of why those people can continue to explore the directions that their culture can take as they encounter Western culture, rather than just being this place and slam down the island. We're going to try to correct on a lot of mistakes that have already been made. Big structures that weren't fitting into the way they built their communities, trying to put them in an infrastructure that made sense to them. Oh, are you ready? Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> This is Mark McCullough. I'm, this is Mark McCullough. I'm going to let him introduce himself and everything. He's the rapid prototyping expert from Art Center, and he is a popular man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi again. My name is Mark McCullough. Uh, I'm the supervisor of the 3D Rapid Modeling Lab at Art Center College of Design. Probably haven't heard of a, a lab such as this because we're only one year old, and we're probably the only one next to Cal State LA who has. Uh, certain equipment such as we. We probably have the most advanced equipment in our lab, but we have great support from the faculty, from the people outside, and from the people who are interested in our students. So we have grown e enormously through support through the outside vendors, believe it or not. They want to come into our place and sponsor us. We said yes. We couldn't say no. You know, give it to us free. We took it free. And we have one of the, uh, basically, west of the Mississippi uh, um, high-tech uh, labs around and it's small in form but at the same time it has a lot to offer I and mean, if, if you would have saw me the first uh, three terms I was there I was in a cramped area with machines all around computers dust flying all over this stuff it was just amazing well they gave me 10 feet next door <laughs> so I can have a computer lab and if you see it now we got another bigger machine which changed the whole floor plan again so we're continuously growing and in fact we just got great compliment from from up front, we call it the administration, the other people, that uh, we are becoming one of the biggest show for the school itself. People are seeing what we have because industry is not all completely there yet. Uh, rapid prototyping is 11 years old this year and started in 80, well, the late 86s, but it's 11 years old now. And rapid prototyping, and not only looking at CNC, which I'll explain later, but that's computer numeric control, rapid prototyping is a way of addition to to nothing basically it's it's building and adding this information not subtracting or taking anything away from it and uh, the first people that came up with 3d systems they developed something called sterile lithography it's probably the godfather of all rapid prototyping uh, uh, industry and it holds the highest tolerance of all rapid prototyping industry um, next well actually this really holds the highest tolerance, but it does the most complex to holding the tolerance I should say gotta be careful in that area uh, Within a couple of years later, someone came out with fused deposition modeling. That's uh, plastic, ABS plastic, wax, MABS, which is medical grade, and now um, elastomer for building flexible tooling. Instead of doing injection molding with flexible rubbers or anything, you can actually produce a flexible part. And I have one here to show. Did I bring it? Yeah. This part right here. It's very fragile, and it's difficult to work with, but it's... Here, grab that real quick. Be careful with it. Go ahead and squeeze it and bend it. That came out of an extrusion. It, it is an exciting process. It's brand new, and it's an elastomer, a thermoplastic elastomer, that now the shoe designers actually can build three-dimensional rapid prototype shoes. And they're flexible. They fit, and they work, and they bend around. Go ahead and pass that around. Make sure I get these back, by the way. It's the only ones I have. Good but, luck. Yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> But anyway, this is a new head added to our machine, which costs $25,000 just to upgrade for this. Seems like a lot of money, but you can make that back in a month if you have a shoe contract, basically. Um, in an industry like ours, education, we can't go out and buy one, so we borrow the heads once in a while for special events. <coughs> but we do have three heads on ours. We have wax, so we can do jewelry, um, uh, investment cax wax, excuse me, <coughs> little, little worn out already. Um, ABS, which we have here, ABS plastic parts, which are very durable and strong. And I'll, I, I didn't bring a, a video on FDM. Couldn't find my video because I just had a big class on it. And I don't know if a student walked off it with that, but I'll explain it to you. I apologize for that. But FDM basically builds this part. And what it does, and I can explain it very simply, it takes ABS plastic in a thin bead form and extrudes it through a little tube all the way through, goes through a heater. Once there in the heater, it melts it down to near liquidation. That's the key part right there. It's near liquidation. And as it comes out, it extrudes it out of a little nozzle about, uh, this one's, we have 12 thousandths and 25 thousandths, size depending on the part and how fast you want to build it in detail. It extrudes it out and it goes layer by layer and fills it up. So I always use, because I always 
kind of drink coffee with my students. I take this cup, and I'm glad I have one in here. I take this cup, and if I had an X-Acto knife, and I sliced it down every ten thousandths of an inch, what would I come up with? A bunch of rings. A dust. <laughs> bunch of, a bunch of rings, if I could slice it that thin. And all those rings can be put back together and built up. Well, what this does with the software and the information creates a tool path which on those boundaries, those circle boundaries, comes in with ABS and fills them. Raster fills them and then vector fills the outside. Puts a perimeter on it and it just builds it step by step by step by step. So now if I pass that apart, did that one already go? I got two out there right now. Did the big one? There's the other one. Oh, I didn't give it out there, did I now? Thank you. That's two. This one's a little broken. It's been handled a lot, but you can feel it. You can feel the stratuses on it, the layers building up. Now, what's nice about that, not only can we do basic geometrical shape, geometric shape, we can do organic shapes. Not only organic shape, we can do two-part shape with part lines with these. This is a Microsoft mouse that was built in the machine. Male and female insertion, so we can put the what? The board in there that's needed to check to see if the mouse works. We can put it back together, and we have a nice little part line that follows, and it can be sanded, painted, uh, tested, um, all, the, all the areas that injection molding can be checked on. It's ABS, so. Right, some water just Oh, thank you, because <laughs> I will get dry. Um, so I'll pass this around. You can see how the pieces go together. And what we do to draw stuff like this and make it easier is not like a free form, Form Z software, which is, is a solid base software. And so, uh, uh, Form Z does work on this very well. What we use is a solid uh, modeler called SolidWorks at school, excuse me, at school. And it's a parametric tool that we use. So we can change it all the time we want to. We can design something, change it by changing dimensions. We work in a 2D form to create 3D images and I'll show you a little sample of that as well. And, and I'm going to bring this back around. You're, I talk a lot about product because that's what we do. We do a lot of environmental as well. Interior, spatial planning and I'll come in back and I'll bring back that around. But right now we've been choosing this and I'm going to show you how this works in your area. In fact, one of the tools that I use was developed by architects. And that's the laser cutter, believe it or not. The laser cutter was developed by an architect firm that had to perfect the model creation. And now we use it as product designers or transportation for engraving, for, for pattern shape, for 2D to 3D parts, because basically if you have a 2D line and you cut a three-dimensional thickness, you get a 3D part out of it. And we're using it enormously. Go ahead and pass that around. Um, one of the neat things, you're not limited to what you can create with the FDM. If you can draw a three-dimensional space, and you know on the computer you need no supports, basically, to build things. This part right here was built on our machine, a ring within a ring, <coughs> okay, in one shot. And I'll explain how that's done. And then this one was stereolithography. I talked about the godfather of all things. This is it. This is one part completely built in a vat, a polymer plastic, catalyzed through lasers, through a laser beam, layer by layer by layer. And this is one part. So. The boat in the bottle, this is a very fragile pea, please be careful with it. The boat in the bottle can be done through this process. When you think, how could it be done? How could it get over the boat? Remember, it's doing layer by layer, so it looks at a set of geometries. I, will, I have the software here, I'll show it to you a little bit how it does it. I got a feeling it might be blurry, because uh, the resolution for me to use this software is very high, and I don't think this is going to project my resolution. Uh, this one right here now, and you're thinking, can I borrow that real quick again? You can pass this one around. Something like this, how does this build, if I was to lay this on the plat and build it this way, how does it build, the, build it up that way without it just falling into space, right? We have something on here called the support mechanism. It's two, it's another, it's called the release ABS plastic that builds with this, it's another color. So as it builds, it builds the full layer. Now it'll build the perimeter and then fill the whole rest with support. Build and build and so it's building a scaffold. And when you're done with it, the scaffold just peels right off. It's a separation. Like stereolithography, they had scaffolding in there because you can't build stuff to stand in free form, especially it overhangs. So we have to build something underneath. Well, the software's smart enough to build that, that scaffolding. And if it'll show up here, it'll be, it, it, you'll be able to see that. One of the nice things that I have about the FDM is movie industry, entertainment. I can scan. I was hung over this day when they scanned my head here. So <laughs> this is me. <laughs> but, we can scan clay images. This was designed by one of our sculptors at school. Uh, he's probably one of the best in the world right now, one of the few best, and he gets contracted out. But he carved this from clay, took it, we digitized it. We took that information. Now we're talking, the digitized time to do this was probably about 17 minutes. 
We scan this, we scan, pick up all the data, and then we put all the data together and it's ready to run. In 17 minutes, we can reproduce it. This one actually took about 25 hours. And you're thinking, wow, 25 hours? Well, it probably took him weeks upon weeks to build the original. It took me 17 seconds to get the information ready to run. And 25 hours later, without man hours, machine hour, so it's running around the clock, I had it the next day. And I made it hollow. I don't have to make it solid like he did. You can see, it's all rastered filled out a quarter of an inch. Now, the movie industry has taken advantage of this enormously. And architects are taking advantage of it enormously. Uh, if you want, let's say, certain types of rocks, certain type of fill for your, for your model or whatever, they have cameras now that can come out to a space, take about a meter in size, an image of a, an area you want. And you can plot these images, take these back, these shapes and forms, and create them to scale for, form for your model, and you're pulling true data off. It's not make-believe, it's true data off the environment, in the environment. And this is getting bigger and bigger. In fact, I'm working with a client when I was telling to him that they're trying to get to that point in their own house. And that's taking maquettes, small little images, scanning them, and blowing them up to full size, to my size, for re uh, reverse engineering. Think of a dinosaur. You ever see those uh, dynamations? The full-scale dinosaurs, how do they do that? Does someone sit there with clay? Well, actually what they do, they use a, about a 10-inch model, scan it, blow it up, just scale it up into the information, and then CNC that information in block form, put it all back together, and clean it up by hand. 35-foot dinosaurs done very fast. Very expensive to be done, but it's cheaper in the long run because the turnaround time is in a month rather than months. And it was just done by a friend of mine for another client, and it was very fast, it was very impressive how he did it, and to see it, it, it looks one-to-one. -one. I mean, just, it's, it's amazing. So scanning, reverse engineering is huge. Now, in the architectural area, I use something very heavily. Uh, let me give you a little background about myself. When I was 14, my father was an auto body man. And it's kind of strange how my life goes. He was, he was basically working with cars, restoring them, working professionally, fixing dings and bumpers and stuff like that. Got me involved with that. I restored cars till I was about 22. Went to Cal State Long Beach. While there, I said, hmm, I already, in that process, I always built furniture at junior colleges and stuff like that. Very into designing furniture. At Cal State uh, Long Beach, I decided, hey, I never really designed or really drawn. I just built from my mind and I take measurements and I do all that. So I thought I would take an, a drafting class. So I started studying architectural drafting. One term, I spent the time on the board learning. We, uh, the first, first course was heavy. We learned to draft, we learned to remodel houses. Um, uh, I had two classes on it and we also did watercolors. I had a really heavy schedule. And after that, I was like, really wasted with it. The next term was AutoCAD, and the introduction to AutoCAD, AutoCAD 9, if you will. <laughs> We're out to 14 now. And studying AutoCAD 9, I go, hey, this is easy. I can draw an entity. It could be infinite, anything I want, any direction I want. And from there, I, this is the honest truth, I got rid of my tools. This is me. This is because I like to do things my way. I'm pretty stubborn. I gave my architectural tools away, my drafting tools, believe it or not. A lot of people are going, whoa, no, I had to because I had some creativity and free form for my airbrushing and stuff like that, but I didn't always want to stay that way because I've done it for so many years. When I learned about the computer, I got into it heavy. Well, now I use AutoCAD 14, I'm heavy into that. I'm heavy into solid modeling, but from there, I just developed. From there, I realized this model can be built off my drawing. Not by me, but by a machine. Did I lose any of the creativities? Yes and no. At the same time, I added to my creativity, but. The physical part of it, I, I left out of it. But the physical part or the emotional side of me was in the computer. Now the computer still is tight in dimensions, but that's where I come in to break that away, to give my free form what I want to shape, see in organic shape. Uh, today I'm in the Class A surfacing. If you're familiar with what Class A surfacing is, rather than the straight two-dimensional, Class A surfacing is surfacing that can be tooled by Lexus, Jaguar. They use that to create their bodies or their forms of the cars. And I design with those tools now. I stay in that area because once I'm done with my design, if it is in class A form, it is production ready. So I can hold on to my information and rather than letting the engineer or someone else tear it apart. Um, really important for me was when I went to the computer area, I seen the future. I mean, because this is when rapid prototyping was kicking in, I stepped into it. Now basically, I have probably truly do have the first title in Southern California as a rapid prototyping instructor because I have all the facility for that. 
And that's the only way that gives it to me. I could still stay with CNC and be considered a rapid prototyper, but now I'm an instructor of it and teaching students in one term, they actually pick up a lot of this information. <laughs> in our lab alone, we have 15 different softwares, 15 different machines types that are used with these softwares too. But the students are able to get the basics and the understanding how to pull the creativity out. Um, for instance, I'm gonna show you one, uh, one video and I'm gonna translate from, think about CAD drawing, we'll come back to the computer, but CAD drawing to machine information. And this is where you guys will be playing in form in the future of rapid prototyping, especially in the industry. This one right here is going to be on laser cam. It's a laser um, video on how models, cre models are created in architectural form. I'll come back to the area of why 3D models are very important to me and to the, your clients. But uh, first I've got to figure out how to work this thing. Did I hit it right? Yeah. Watch this video here. Let me just turn that one off. Is it working? Extraordinary How do you turn it up? The and oh. the eye. The fine detail, This level of perfection is no accident. It takes time, energy, creativity, and the property. To help the vision of design before it is built, and to communicate this vision to the client and to the public, the most powerful tool is a three-dimensional model. The best way to see a building before it is actually built, and see it in the early stages of the project, where it counts the most. If this works or not. Your time and money are invested. I don't think this one will project. I'm going to just have to use this monitor. Until now, building models has been a slow and expensive process, involving many hours of tedious manual work using traditional tools, the mat knife and the straight edge. Imagine not having to work hours by hand, seeing the results instantly. It's AutoCAD. As the design becomes more complex, the vision begins to take shape. Normally, computer drawings are output to a pen plotter, yielding a two-dimensional drawing. But the same information sent to laser cam will yield cut out or scored pieces ready to assemble into a model. Any shape you draw in CAD can become laser cut components. Imagine the possibilities. Laser cam is as easy to use as a pen plotter. When the cam drawing is complete, the appropriate material is placed on laser cam's cutting surface. Then just close the cover and press start. Now we have a computerized motion control system to direct an invisible laser beam which cuts or scores the material. Minutes later, a laser cut component is finished ready to be incorporated into the model. The laser cuts two-dimensional shapes, but the assembled results are definitely three-dimensional. 3D effects are created by cutting, assembling, and layering different parts together. Intricate scribing patterns add texture and surface detail. Laser cam is state-of-the-art technology which is practical and easy to use. A workhorse designed to be used all day, every day. And unlike typical industrial lasers, all of this power is housed in one sleek package the size of a copy machine to be used in your own homes. Consider the advantages of laser cam. 85% of the cost of most models is labor. Any tool which saves time saves money. Most models are so well suited to laser cutting they can 
be produced in hours instead of days. Parts that take hours to cut by hand now are laser cut in minutes. Having laser cam in house lets you get immediate results and feedback on your designs. Complex designs, nearly impossible by conventional means, are easily cut or stored. A level of precision only a surgically fine laser beam can deliver. The relief achieved by layering these parts creates exquisite detail. Because panels are cut from full sheets, the strength, simplicity, and elegance of your models will be vastly improved. LaserCam will allow you to develop models of various scales, creating study models with much more detail, all done in a fraction of the time. You also have the freedom to try many options and revisions, seeing the results in units. Models are quicker to build with LaserCam and rebuild when the inevitable revisions are called for. Laser cam accommodates many different kinds of materials, including plastics, wood, plexiglass, and fabric. In fact, almost anything that can be cut or stored, laser cam can handle. Laser cam is not limited to architectural modeling. It is being used by professionals in many fields, including manufacturing, engineering, interior design, industrial design, sign making, package design, filmmaking, and fine arts. Applications have included topographic models, engineering prototypes, also airplane kits, signs of all sizes, even cutting carpeting. Laser cam helps bridge the crucial gap between design and full-scale production. The potential applications are limited only by your imagination. Scale Models Unlimited, pioneers in the use of lasers for model making, have developed and manufactured laser cam. Scale Models Unlimited continues to develop innovative techniques and applications for laser cam, <coughs> which are reflected in their own projects. The advantages are clear. If your business could benefit from a design tool that lets you visualize your ideas quickly and accurately, a process that dramatically reduces fabrication time and simplifies assembly and finishing, exquisite details such as perfectly square inside corners, uniform store lines, and finely polished edges, versatile graphic arts capability, a new level of precision and accuracy, and models that have improved strength, simplicity of construction, and elegance. Then it's time to bring the capabilities of laser cap to your business. Okay, you can do the lights. Well, there you go. It's an idea of what are you going to get out of your model, looking at stuff like this. We have two of them now. We started with one, we have two. But you got to look at the price on that. Um, it talks about your client or, or, or your business. This is a business here. Education is a business, and I, and, I, and I treat it like a business because I work outside in the industry, and I want to bring that technology to the students because once that technology is given to the students, it expands our productivity out in the industry. Uh, as an educator, I believe in new technology. I don't stay away from it. I find it, I eat it up, and I try to study it for the students and for my own pleasure and business as well outside. You can see something like this is creating ac accurate models off your information via uh, data on the computer. Okay, how important is that? Scale form is very important to hold that. To see lighting, three-dimensional models are so important to see how lighting reflects, where the sun is, where the moon comes at night, and how the light hits inside for, for wear and tear. And you can almost even visualize exterior, like, uh, like your landscape, how the trees will grow and affect the environment around you with real models three-dimensional to scaled form being at trees being at houses being at landscape you're gonna get that feel for the client you're gonna get that feel for yourself you can study lighting into a form that's interior as well take off the top see how the lighting reflects in there true lighting and that's where we're at today finding everything in virtual reality as possible be it through a computer uh, uh, animation or be it through a solid model of some sort uh, I'm excited about the laser, but I look at the laser as an exacto knife. 
a $42,000 exacto knife, basically. Okay, and that's how much uh, a 50 watt, and we have a 50 watt because we cut a lot of uh, wood images. And if you have passed around my book, did you guys pass around that book and look at the laser information in there? We do a lot of prototype chairs on there prior prior to building the chairs on the laser. And this checks it in quarter scale, and then we look at it and we analyze it. And the next step we do with that information, after we cut it out of the laser, this is, that, this is part of the gear from that automaton. Did you see all those gears? Well, the student's in an insane asylum now, cutting all those gears. And he also cut a thousand chain links. I didn't bring the chain link. And drilled holes in it and dowed them to hold the chain links together. A thousand of them. I mean, the guy, I just couldn't believe it. It was about $800 worth of just this air, airplane plywood that he used. But it was a gorgeous piece. And the only problem was he was environmental. Product saw it and stole them, put them into product. <laughs> he loved it so much. But he's one of my students now, and he's taking my class as we speak. Um, this, this is uh, one of the parts. You can see how clean it cuts. And the students sat there and believe it and sanded all this stuff. He did a fantastic job on it. But the creativity, and this is the first term we had it. When you have a tool, you're not limited to the creativity that you can pull. If you had just a single tool, an exacto, a, 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 um, a bandsaw, whatever, you're limited because you know how long and tedious and the shapes you're going to get out of it. If you saw what the laser can do, the shape is not impossible. Rapid prototyping, no shape is impossible. True working prototypes are not impossible. And that's what we're stressing now at the school. Uh, clients want to see not just a foam mock-up of Ren shape. They're, they're truly looking at this. Okay, and it's very, very important to hand this to a client now, nowadays when you get out in the market. And it also builds your resume. That's what I always tell my students. Now you're a new generation. You got a resume that says CNC, FDM, fused up system model. Some of them do sterile lithography because I have a company I work with and I send my students down there and they give it to them for free. We have great support from outside people, which has been very exciting. You have the same opportunity to use a lot of this equipment, but at this time, there's, there's companies outside that build these models for them. You give them their, your data, it can come from Form Z, it can come from AutoCAD, it can come from freehand. Any shape you want can be cut. Because these machines work off raster and vector information. Basically, what would be raster, but a bunch of pixels filled up, and a vector would be point-to-point -point line creation. And it could be a Bezier curve too as well. In fact, polylines and beziers work faster on these machines because it's one swoop for this machine rather than point to point to point moving. Um, that, I'm going to show you something else about the rapid prototyping on CNC now. Uh, from, from, building, from building with a, a, a additive information, we're going to do with subtraction information. You, you saw those topographical information. One of the nice things we were able to do a lot with a lot of the CAT CAM systems or ARC CAM systems, we can take a topographical picture of a view and do it in black and white and do gradation through relief movement. And from that gradation, we can actually machine those topographicals now that fast. So there's a lot of ways and processes to get the data you want. Now, when you look at your uh, topples, the graphs and just the perimeter lines, those can be machined or cut on the laser and stacked up. Uh, I was looking at one of the gentlemen, he, uh, he said he spent, he's right over here, he spent a couple nights doing it. And in 15 minutes, I can truly have that same information from him. If he, if he just even scanned that topple and gave me the perimeter lines, I can scan that and bring it into my machine and scan it and give it right back to him. Uh, there are outside sources that you could do it, and they charge about a uh, dollar a minute to have this done. That's what you give them the data, they plug it in, you throw your material down there, it cuts it, and whatever it costs in minutes, the machine tells you they charge you a dollar a minute. Um, and it's and a lot of uh, architect firms are contracting these people out to do this. It's a huge industry right now. Job shops are growing like crazy. You come up with a, a business loan, you put it together, you'll be very busy with this with this uh, laser, from engraving to cutting to uh, producing models. Let me try to get this one up and running. I'm going to show you how CNC works off vector information. Um, can everybody see this a little bit? The screen? You can move closer. Yeah, I want to show you one thing about rapid prototype. It was very important to me to show you. I'm going to unplug the wall here. It's not holding the resolution. I've got to hold a high resolution for my software. And I'm going to explain how rapid prototyping basically works in the form of 3D modeling. I'm going to take you through the rapid prototyping, then I'll go through the design part of it. Is it clear? That would be this one here. Let me put this here. And then my 
mouse is here. This is a Let me get it up here. This is the software we use to create, uh, we take STL files. That's very important to understand what we're doing here. We take a solid model and we create an STL out of it. A st STL file is a sterile lift file. It's an extension we use in the PC. That is considered the rapid prototyping file. Now here's the goal. That means I can scan, but believe it or not, there's a machine out there right now called the Body Scanner by Cyberware, can scan her whole body in 17 seconds and take a color image of her body for mapping purposes. Okay, why is this good? Why is this important? They just recently, uh, he's a friend of mine who owns a company. Uh, let me get a picture up here. What you're going to see here is secretive, but you can see it. I'll let you see it because uh, I'm going to show you how, how neat this is. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Everybody's familiar with Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? The latest movie he did was Batman, I believe. Okay? His body, to build Mr. Freeze's outfit, what do you think it would cost him to stand around while they build that pseudo armor for him? A lot of money. Okay? What they did to create that, and they used it all throughout Terminator, Liquid Metal, they used this machine. They, they, they scanned his body, took that digital information to a friend of mine, another friend, CyberFX, and machined his body. One to one in size. Okay? And what they do with that, they give it to the seamstress or the, 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 the costume designer, and they have a look alike of Arnold Schwarzenegger right there. And they build the, 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 uh, the pseudo armor around him. Now, the, the, the thing about that was, is there's a little story behind that, that Arnold, he's so self-conscious. When he was there getting scanned, the first scan, he was relaxed. They told him to be relaxed. So he was like, and he looked kind of bulgy, fat and stuff like that. So he goes, no, no, I want to be scanned again. So he pumped up. But when they built the suit, it was built to his, it was too tight. So it was kind of funny. They, you know, he had to walk around a lot of, lot of restriction. And that was the funny part about that whole thing. And, they, and we were laughing our heads off about that. Was the scan smarter? <laughs> yeah. But it was him. If you look at it, it's one to one. And they've done so many different scannings uh, from Tim, um, Tim Carey, all those guys. Now, this one is a, a file I worked on. But I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to have to rotate it, I believe. Um, <laughs> Let's go negatively. I'm going to move it around a little bit. Now this is like 40 megabytes of information. 40 megabytes of point clouds. 40 megabytes of polygonal file. Has anybody guessed who it is yet? Well, thank you. Well, that's a, I guess that would be a compliment. So I'm getting, I move it around. So much information. My, my, my computer is pretty fast, and this is 40 megabytes of information flying around. Stop. Don't go that far. <laughs> I think I might have went a little bit too far. OK, here it is. Who is that? X-Files guy. That's the guy from the X-Files. Mulder. That's his name. I couldn't think of his name. Let me, uh, let me rotate it back a little bit. But they can scan. Does he know you have this? Nah, kind of. I did work for them, but I just show it real quick and then no one ever gets it. It's, it's interesting to see, but this is the idea of what I'm trying to tell you what Rapid Prototype is all about. Oh, there's a better image of him. We can take the head. It took 17 seconds to get this information. Now, for what I do, and it's going to have some holes in it, but I clean them up later on. What I have to do, and this is how hard my job is in rapid prototyping. For you as a sculptor, what would you have to do? Uh, clay, cut, cut, cut. Now, I have this image of scanned information. I take it, and I say, oh, let's go to the next one. Let's slice that thing up. It's going to take a 10,000 slice of it right now. It takes a little bit of time, but remember I told you it only takes 15 minutes to do it? Well, this is a head, and I reproduce this head. No one has saw, saw it yet. I just gave it right back to them. But it takes a little while. It'll start producing here. In a minute, I hope. Yeah. In a sense, yeah. <laughs> Very fast. And I and realize, I can scan that. There's the slices. It's starting to slice it right now. It's filling the information, looking at it, slicing every ten thousandths of an inch. That's that information. Then the next process I do, where'd my froggy go? Where's the froggy? I take, take that information and I say, run a toolpath to fill this information up. The computer does that. It calculates all that information. And then run a support path to, to pick up any other information on the ears or whatever. And it goes on and goes on and it adds all this information. And it's all a touch of a button. It will kick off here in a minute. It's a big file though, 40 megabytes of slicing. It's fast, 17 minutes later I'll have it. I sent it over the machine. Uh, I think it, this one was like 52 hours. 
ran it Saturday, got it back Sunday evening and stuff like that. So I didn't do any work basically on it. It's going to take a while. I think I already do have the slices and stuff. Let me try to stop this and see if I already have them. Let's get the laser. What's that? Let's get the laser. Going. Okay, uh, open. Oh, okay, okay, I'll get that one going now. Okay, well, this one's going, the slices will show it. Let me come over here and get my other computer going on. This one, actually, what I'm going to show you is a small portable CNC machine that's a desktop unit for studying. Oh, do we have that other one? Let's plug it in now. I need more room over here. I was told I better hurry. You guys have other classes and stuff. Um, again, rapid prototype. We've got to do things faster. This basically, can you hit the lights now? This basically, what you see here is just a. Uh, I'm wrong keyboard. <laughs> this basically, all it is is a door panel that I use. And you can see it as topographical information. Now, to take information that's on a surface base, to run a toolpath, is, I'm going to show you how we do this. It's all again by computer, makes things easier. Okay, we create a toolpath. I gotta look at this screen. A multi surface, because there's many surfaces finish, parallel, give it a name, overwrite it, all surfaces. It looks for surfaces, and done. I'm gonna kind of lie to this and make it a little bit bigger so it doesn't take that long. Keep the tool down. There's settings that I teach my students and people how to, how to run this. Very simple. Give it a tool diameter. I should have checked to see if this was metric or not. And it calculates the information in slicing. Just like we look at, when we look at a, a rapid prototype, it's all about slicing, taking surfaces and slicing them all up. And it's preparing the surface as a multi-surface. And as it goes through, it'll create a tool path for me. Very efficient, very simple, based off the tool radius, because I'm using a, a ball end mill on this. Oh, something spilled. I probably should have grabbed something smaller, but I want to show you in size how. Let me uh, get something smaller for you real quick. In fact, let me design something real quick. I'm going to create a rectangle, two points. Um, turn the lights on real quick so I can do this real fast. I'll just lay one out real quick. About four by two. 1.5. Save. I'm just drawing this box that I have here real quick and I'll create a, a construction plane. Spline. And creating three dimensional is pretty, pretty easy and fun to work with. Actually, uh, hold on. Where's the coons? This one's a little faster. It's already done for me.
This could be a section of a topographical map of some sort. And you can see the shape of it. It's organic in form. We can toolpath. Uh, I'll do a flow line. Actually, no, because it's... I did a quick toolpath, smaller than the step over, so it'd be able, we're all able to see it run really fast here. And we can see it in the Boolean method here. It's going to be really gougy, but realize I could have t tightened over the step over. Go ahead and shut the lights, and they'll be able to see this better. This is how we, we can see a CNC being moved. So once we have surface information, it could be topographical or whatever, we can get a toolpath off that. And you can see it's a radius tool bit and it's easy forming. Okay, it's a big step over. I can do fine, I can do up to thousands, I can do, you know, small as I wish to have on a step over, depending on the bit. We do automotive, we do product, we do environmental, a lot of our furniture design is from that. And it's that simple. So we're subtracting information rather than adding this information. The same information can be sent over this machine immediately. You've seen that, I'll send it over right now. Can you hit the lights again real quick and I'll kill this and I'll send it over and we'll call it quits and ask any questions that you may have. First of all, I have four. Um, Are you gonna actually fabricate that now? Yeah, well, I, I'll start it to let you guys see it. It's four inches by Z negative inch. And the Y is, eh, it'll fit. So I can send this over to the machine right now. Let me double check something here. I gotta find out where the file went. Hold on. And how's the file? Oh, it's under NC. Okay. to get it over here in space. <laughs> now I'm going down about an inch, so I gotta be kind of careful with this. Um, I'm hoping I'm in the right quadrant and everything like that. I'm not gonna touch up on the machine totally because I don't know if I have enough Z, I just did this off of the fly. And to run it, it is... Okay. 
My mistake, hold on one quick. See, I didn't check the whole size of that. My rapid was too high. I didn't think I was gonna run that one, but let me just change that real fast on the fly here. To run another toolpath, it's very simple. I'm gonna do something real quick. X form scale, all entities. Done at the origin, 0.5. I'm gonna scale it half its size because I don't know if I have enough information. F9, perfect. So, tool. <laughs> This value right here was wrong. That should be like 0.2, something real tiny. And I'm using a quarter inch bit, so I better change that too. Except this, yes. I scaled it half its size, it's only about two inches now. I'm gonna move down to Z real quick. Ren shake, and you can cut topograph. Remember, my step over is big right now. I didn't do it tight. And that thought, I know it took a while. I, I didn't have my files configured. This hasn't been fired up for a year, so I had to go back and configure some stuff real quick. But you're able to take that form we just did and machine it. You can keep it tighter, depending on the information. And you can scale form, change real fast, and it's all done by the computer. I'm doing nothing. Remember how it started, went down one side and went down the other? It's doing its form right now. And this is wren shape. They come in different densities, softer, heavier, and I brought a couple samples over. And it finishes it off. Now, in no way, in no way will I machine something this loosely. We usually call this a, a rough pass, okay? But I can tighten it up, make it totally tight, and say, I want to step over, not, I did, I think, a quarter of an inch. You can see it's the size of the bit each step over. I can say I want it like a thousandth of an inch. And when you're done with it, it's clean as your hand can feel. Basically, the scallops are so fine. And these are called heavy scallops. But you can get the shape off the geometry right away. So the idea of taking rapid prototyping from any digital information, be it surface, be it solid modeling, it's very simple. And it's about a 10-step information on where you position and do everything. And the students go through that. And then you're able to take a disk unit like this. The FDM is a desk unit. There's no toxic problems with it. This may be a little toxic because of the dust, but you can hook up a vacuum cleaner right to it. 
And you're able to take this information and work to a form that you can never imagine. Uh, biomorphic walls, believe it or not, are being built by this same fact on machine right now. You take a shape of a wall, and, you, and this guy's done a great article. Mark uh, Robertson, a friend of mine I met uh, while working on CNC, he did a shape and just a beautiful study of a single wall that was in shape and all forms of shape. And he built these uh, internal lattice development on it. And then he wrapped... He, he cut notches in it and slid ABS plastic down there for the frame and poured it. And when it was done, all he did was break off the tabs and everything fell apart. And he had this biomorphic shaped wall. It was gorgeous. It was absolutely gorgeous. He got written up on it and stuff like that. But the study of using rapid prototyping for wall development is huge right now. They're growing into that area for architects as well. So when, when your shapes are not so geometrical anymore, you're going to be able to use these machines to get it to the form you're looking for and, and just express that emotion that you've been trying to give to your client and stuff in scale form. Could you, could you enter a student thing in right now if somebody had something in the form, so you could you, yeah. you do it? Yeah, you need to bring it as an IGES, though. I need it as an, a translation as an IGES file. I just see, you got different extension. An IGES is a surface translator, and uh, I can read surfaces in there. As a DXF translation, that's a data exchange format, that's basically vector lines. It turns your surface into lines, and I can't do anything with that. I need a surface mesh, of a NURB surface of some sort. But if you have one, I can, I can show you how I can um, machine that. How large are those machines? As oh. How big a block are we talking about? Okay, how large is the machine? Uh, they're building them 60 feet by 20 feet, uh, by, by, by how tall? Let me think, it was 15 feet tall. They're doing yachts with them. They're doing motor homes with them. They get as, they're custom made now, today's. We have, oh, I didn't mention what we just got, guys. I forgot to tell you. I have a five axis, just came in a month ago. Uh, we're, gonna, we're one of the first schools with a five, we're probably the only school around that has a five axis CNC machine. What is a five axis? I didn't cover that. Well, three axis, what you saw, this was a true 3D axis. You know, move. A movement of a true 3D is a helix, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Well, a five axis, other than X and Y and Z movement, we got a, 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 a C and a B movement. So I can come over here, and that's what we're, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be scanning bodies. We're going to be doing this and doing this organic form or human shape for the entertainment industry. We train entertainment. So I can scan her again, and I can take her in a block of foam metal like that, and my machine will come over here, rotate this way, and start machining her face out. Right there, all 360 degrees around. Off that scan data. So they're doing that right now. We're the first school going to be jumping onto that. I've been studying scanning information enormously. In fact, that's where an industry is going heavier and heavier and heavier scanned information. Any questions? Other questions? Yeah, when you make these, these prototypes with the, the layered of ABS, mm -hmm. after you make that, do you use that to make a mold with? No, you can make molds. Uh, can I have all my books and my samples back, please? Before anybody leaves, don't take off with them. So could someone go? Um, well, we, we make them like that, and we can sand them, and we can paint them, fix them up to, to what they would truly look like on the market. Right. So yeah, you can make molds off them too. Uh, leave your name. Or yeah. can you make the molds with it? Yes, you can. Make the, make the negative thing. And you can do that. And that's what we would do a lot with this too, as well. Look, I have a shape here. That's a wonderful shape. Would you, would you be able to make something like that? Like, let's say, to enlarge? The 20%? Everybody, he has a good question here. Can I enlarge this 20%? The answer is yes. If I can draw this, I can enlarge it. Now, here's the trick thing that I can do that oh, you, you can't do. Draw it. Well, no, I can, can scan, scan it. it. Yeah, and enlarge it. Yeah, I can scan, but we would paint it white because white doesn't uh, absorb uh, light or reflect it. And, and it's real simple. You just put like a water-based paint. But here's the key thing. I have this. I can mirror it over and get the opposite side of it. If it was a right and left image, a handle or whatever, that's one of the nice things about digital information. If I was building a, a, a grip for a bicycle, which a student uh, worked on last term, we have never had the opportunity to take that grip and reproduce it identically as a mirrored image. Once we have the data, just say mirror. Boom. Give me the opposite. You got right and left. Yeah. Question? Uh, yes, you can be done. Computer numerical control. So the computer, through the numerical values of Cartesian coordinates, we can point positions for this machine to go. So can you do a night session at all times? Not yet. They've been asking me to do that. And it would be exciting. Uh, I have 70 students right now that are going through my lab. It's probably the biggest. And it's a small lab. And it's just, it's heavy. But uh, no, but if you have an exchange program, because I know I taught Caltech students this stuff last, uh, when, my, when I first was there. Can so I you to come here and do a workshop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would yeah. you like that? Yeah. 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 I have portable machines, too. Can you put metal bits on this? 
machine? Oh, this has a carbide tip right now, titanium coated. Yes, you can put metal, co uh, high speed steel, car uh, carbide tips. If, can you, oh, go ahead. Can you put carbon in, uh, into wax? Yes, we can cars and there's a machinable wax out there that doesn't melt and load up the bit that they use. It's very expensive, it's like wrench shape cost. Uh, it's very, very expensive. Have you guys messed with wrench shape before? Never have? Let me, let me show you another density. Uh, oh, can you grab that blue one right there? Yeah. Here's foam we do. This is what Arnold Schwarzenegger was cut out of. This is like high density foam. This is what we use because we can foam that. We, we can, got samples of the stuff yeah. in the library. We can way. coat it. We can, we can, uh, here's another density. This is higher density. This is like, feel the weight difference on it. In terms of modeling, uh, does this support NURBS? Yes, that's all we machine basically, NURBS, on this one here. Right. Uh, can you do it on gels or is it too delicate? Yeah. On the new, you know, 99% gel? I have no idea. Well, I haven't tried that. Then they, they're almost the density yeah. barrier. Really? Yeah. Uh, one important thing, he said, can you do it on NURBS? NURBS is what we can machine animate to the best. When I use scan data, it's an STL point polygonal file. It's not easy to work with at that time. There's not a lot you can do. You can't even, it's hard to machine off it too as well. But there's software that picks up those point clouds and allows you to, it builds a mesh on it. Now there is no way that I can scan her body or your body and say, turn you into a nerve surface. You have to patch it. You have to build it and build it and build it. And, build. and this is a lot of money. But once you have that information, it's just like worth a lot. It's worth, a, you can sell it on the internet, $350 a file. For people to pick that up, but building nerve surfaces is probably the, the 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 I think the gold mine in the future is if I can scan him and turn him into a nerve surface, I'll be the richest man in the world. For reverse engineering, that's what we work with. For any uh, any design, it's nerve surfaces. So, because nerve surfaces can be then generated into solids as well. I didn't give a demo on solid modeling. I wanted to show you how awesome solid modeling in the true parametric form is. You would have been blown away. Maybe that would be a workshop, but it's very very exciting stuff. So. Any other questions? How much are these? This was about $3,500 desktop unit. Ah. Software's $13,000. Ah. <laughs> that's the hard. But for students with an ID, it's $800. Believe it or not. So that's that's the goal. Twice that size. Uh, about 50,000, I think. Or oh, twice the size? No, that's 19,000 for the uh, 19 inch by 20 inch one. So I cut something about 18 inches wide? Uh, uh, one bigger than this one? Yeah. yeah. They go up to 5 by 8, they go bigger. There's a, if you want to use one of these machines, you have nerve surfaces, and you know you, know, you know, want to use them, there's a place over by Cal Poly Pomona called Carpe, Carpe Diem. And they sell drafting supplies, and they have a 5 by 8 table this, of this machine caliber. They have the master cam that will machine it, and they also have laser cutters and plotting facility. It's, it's made for model architects building. Carpe Diem, he's a friend of mine. In fact, he just bought one and I trained him on it. So he has one of these four by eight specifically for architecture. Uh, companies and students, if you wish. I think he might give you a discount because I know all the architects from Cal Poly go over there and use him a lot. It's just like down the street from him. To put Carpe Diem. To put this together and use the software, how much understanding does one have to have of other programs? Uh, um, well, phew. Quite a bit of understanding in the sense that you need to go to school and learn it, but I teach designers. Designers are not manufacturers in any way, but they still build prototypes. Yeah. Well, my students come out within about four weeks with me using these machines to a basic level, and then it just builds after that. They start with 2D, pocket and contours. I can pocket out holes, and we do shapes, and the next step is they, see, they go to alias, and they discern these organic shapes, and then we bring them in. I show them how to position it on the solid block, and then they machine it all out. So, you guys are welcome to stop by sometime. Um, I'm only there Monday through Thursdays. Fridays I'm off. I'm able to do stuff like this. But uh, you'll be interested in seeing what's going on and some of the like uh, the projects that we've done with automobiles and cars and stuff. So, thank you. Any other questions, real quick? That's that's not the right machine to um, to make three-dimensional models, though, right? For like architectural models, yeah, like the laser would be like, like this. this. It would be perfect. For with yeah. This one? yeah. How do you want to uh, well, you, get in these, well, these areas? And, the, and certain stuff like this might be done by hand, but you can actually build a jig that will hold it in this form, machine it this way, okay. machine it this way, machine it, machine it, machine it, okay? But uh, something like this, I would do it on the FDM and cast it. If you want the workshop in this, you're going to have to make the noise, okay? Did they return all my pieces? Oh, great. Yeah, this is the FDM. Do you see that laser bar? Yeah. Where's that at? Right. Right. It's got to come from students. Give it to me. I'll take it to Neil. That's the only way it's going to happen. Anybody see my laser book? 
Yes. The laser book? Oh, so you can have a this is fused deposition modeling, but it's an elastomer. Again? Elastomer plastic, a, yeah. a thermal elastomer. And the technique it was it was fused deposition modeling, it's stratasys. Build up, build up of, yeah. Up of, uh, single layers. Right. Uh -huh. Is there? And this you're doing it at your school? Yes. Uh -huh. We have it at our school. Oh, I'm missing a book. There's one more book like this. Oh, there it is. This stuff, and he's booked up. Ha, 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 students, it's like a black market in spots. Yeah. In this Sorry. <laughs> but if you get it going here, we can have it.